Well, just like you can get caught up in inspiring things, you sometimes can get caught up in injurious things. Somebody in here knows what it is to be caught up in a mess. There is a preacher in the house. It, is, it was pastor's desire this weekend to have the sons of the church bring a word for you, the people of God. Amen? Amen. Last night, it was Reverend Emmett Dunn. Mm -hmm. But this morning, we have Reverend Dr. David Emmanuel Goatley. And he is the executive secretary treasurer of our Lock Carey Foreign Missions Convention. This is our convention. We are a missionary church, amen? This is our convention, and this is one of the con most beloved conventions for me, I can say. Um, every time I go to this convention, I get I, I, I'm on fire. The, the, the fire is rekindled every time, and I reorient myself as to what I am supposed to be doing. And it is under this leadership of Reverend Dr. Goatley that uh, it stokes the fire. And you will see what I'm talking about once he gets up here. He is a passionate preacher. He is... Uh, a passionate professor, and he is just on fire for the Lord. I just want you to know that. He is on fire to be the help and the voice of the people who have no voice. He wears the Lord on his sleeve, and he goes out and preaches truth to power. And I want you that to resonate in your spirit. And I want you to welcome him. And good morning. good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I uh, am grateful uh, to Pastor Wesley for the privilege of uh, being given the opportunity to practice preaching this morning. <laughs> and I'm grateful uh, to be at, uh, at home with family and friends. I'm thankful to uh, Reverend Norfleet for her generosity. Some people you have to pay to be kind to you. <laughs> but your friends say the nicest things. And uh, so, so I am uh, grateful. I'm mostly a, an itinerant, so I'm preaching uh, 30 to 40 congregations a Sunday. So sometimes people say, where are you? And it's I'm somewhere working for the Lord. And it's good to have a place to come home and people know when you're gone. Yeah. Sometimes you're gone and nobody knows. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. But it's good to be here and home this morning. Let me say thank you for the generosity of the Alfred Street Baptist Church in the global missional network called Lot Carry, where we help churches to extend the Christian witness throughout the world. We come alongside indigenous communities engaged in ministries of evangelism, compassion, empowerment, and advocacy where we are able to offer financial support, prayer partnership, and technical assistance so that together we can touch lives with the transforming love of Christ. And we're so grateful for the deep and generous investment of the Alfred Street Church in what's going on around the world. Deacon Vernon, who um, led in this most recent song, is one of the team leaders for teams that get deployed to Haiti to help to build and minister. And we're grateful for that, grateful for the teams uh, that have gone to Flint, Michigan, and for the investment in water and sanitation and health 
and you'd like to know the teams that have gone that uh, we've recently employed eight men to keep that going. You can only do so much on volunteer steam when it's day in and day out. Uh, but uh, your investments are helping to launch that and we're about to launch a new nutrition program to bring organic foods to people who've been poisoned by lead in Flint. We're thankful for uh, last year that uh, the Alfred Street Church made a generous grant to the Lot Carey Mission School in Liberia to provide a brand new classroom block and renovate another one so that there are eight brand new classrooms uh, in Liberia where children can come to a place to learn with dignity. And so you've made that happen. So we're grateful. So your sisters and brothers would have me to say thank you for your partnership in this ministry. Turn your attention with me for these few preaching moments to the gospel according to Luke chapter number five. We'll beginning it, begin reading in verse number one. The gospel according to Luke chapter five, beginning in verse number one. Won't you stand as we hear the word of God. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. <clears throat> but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so, also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. <clears throat> then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> For these few preaching moments today, I'd like to ask you to gather with me around this preaching subject, caught up in Jesus. <clears throat> Do you, anybody in here remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? <laughs> just, just need to see what kind of crowd. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> About 20 years ago, I was with Fred Rogers and it was in a small setting in a small room and 
One of the things that struck me was when he was talking to someone, he was totally engaged. You know, Fred Rogers was a celebrity, and so you had people moving around and trying to get his attention and sometimes trying to position themselves in his peripheral vision so that he would look off, but he never moved his gaze. He just paid total attention to the person he was speaking with time after time. That inspired me and I decided I would try to do it. I get it right about half the time, which means I fail half the time. But you know how sometimes you're talking to people and somebody will come up and hit you on your shoulder or try to distract you. About half the time I can pay attention and the other half I blow it. But he inspired me to try to work at being present and paying attention to what's going on. And we live with so many distractions. There's so many distractions. Somebody before these few minutes are up is going to turn to your smartphone because you can't pay attention. I left mine upstairs so I wouldn't be tempted. But have you ever been caught up in something? where you are totally engaged, where you're almost oblivious to anything else happening, where you are absorbed in the moment. The recent Olympics had some people caught up in women's gymnastics. I mean, there were people calling the names of women gymnasts that had never paid attention because something happened. It was an inspiring experience so that between Ali Raisman and Gabby Douglas and Madison Koshin and Laurie Hernandez and especially Simone Biles, yes. people have never paid attention. All of a sudden got caught up in the experience. Some people get caught up in aesthetics, the beauty of a moment, a sunrise or a sunset. Get caught up, lose track of time. Some of us get caught up in artistry. Sometimes when you're singing, people start singing a song and some point during the music, they stop singing the song and the song sings them. It, you get caught up. Yeah. Once upon a life, I was a church musician, and I sometimes when a musician starts playing, and sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes something starts playing you. And you even start doing things that you didn't know was in you to do because you get caught up. Sometimes we get caught up in the beauty of life. A newborn baby and the awesomeness of life, the privilege and responsibility of caring for this new soul. Some of us know what it is to get caught up. Well, just like you can get caught up in inspiring things, you sometimes can get caught up in injurious things. Somebody in here knows what it is to be caught up in a mess. Where you, you, you started out using a substance socially. And then it moved to recreationally. And then it moved to abusively. And then you plummeted into addiction. You got caught up in something you didn't mean to. But you got on a slippery slope and found yourself caught up in something you didn't mean to be. Somebody in here knows what it is to be caught up in toxic relationships. 
where you know it's bad for you, but you can't cut yourself loose or won't cut yourself loose. You get emotionally beat up. You get physically assaulted. You get sexually violated, and you stay there because you're caught up in something that won't let you go. I don't know what you caught up in today, but my hope, my wish for you is that whatever you've been caught up in, that soon you can find yourself caught up in Jesus. <laughs> Where you, you get totally engaged and totally absorbed become oblivious to the other things that are calling your name because you are caught up. You've lost yourself. You used to try to play with Jesus, but now Jesus orders your steps. <laughs> caught up in Jesus. That's what happened to Peter. Peter is a fisherman, and he's at the lake of Gennesaret. And Jesus is standing at the side of the lake and teaching, and so many people are coming to him. So many people are attracted to what Jesus has to say. The crowd grows, and you know how a crowd get. A crowd doesn't know how to behave itself. <laughs> Crowds kind of start taking on lives and movements of their own, and when you're even in the crowd, you lose your own capacity sometimes to be yourself. And so he's in the crowd and the crowd is pushing. And so Jesus realizes that these people are going to push me in the water. And if I'm going to talk to them, I need to be able to get out from them. And so he gets in a boat that is there, just steps in the boat, doesn't ask, just gets in the boat. <clears throat> And it's Simon's boat. And then he says to Simon, push out into the water so that I can talk to these people. So Simon, who, is, who has been fishing all night, he was an entrepreneur, he was a business owner, and he was a commercial fisherman. And commercial fishermen at that time, they fished with nets at night. Because at night is when the fish came closer to the surface. So it was a graveyard shift job. <clears throat> and so from 11 to 7, say, they'd be out all night fishing. And they'd been out all night long and had not caught any fish. Have you ever, you ever been there where you've done all that you were supposed to do, did the right thing, the right way, but nothing happens? You just come up dry. And so they'd been out all night. They were professionals now. They were not rookies. They knew what to do. They knew when the fish came. They knew what to do. They had the right equipment. They had the right bait. They fished all night long. Nothing happened. And so what they did is in the daybreak, they came and were mending their nets, repairing their nets because they were going out fishing the next night. And so while he's repairing his net, Jesus says, Simon, push out in the deep. So the first thing Simon does is Simon alters his agenda for Jesus. Now, he had something to do. It wasn't like Simon was sitting there doing nothing. Simon was involved, he was engaged in some meaningful activity, repairing his net because he was a responsible citizen, he was a successful fisherman, he had something meaningful to do, but he could stop what he was doing at the word of Jesus. And sometimes we want to put Jesus off. I'm busy now, but when I get through, I'll do what Jesus wants me to do. When I, I'll get around to it later, but you know, by the time later comes, your energy is gone, your time is gone, and then you're giving Jesus what's left over. But he altered his agenda. 
because Jesus told him to. I wonder if there's anybody in here who you, you know Jesus is talking to you, but you're putting Jesus off. I got some things I need to do first. And when I get this done, then I'll do what Jesus wants. I don't know how many people can tell you that's bad, bad, bad strategy. And then you wake up one day saying, I wish I had. So he altered his agenda because Jesus said, do this. So he pushes out in the boat, gives Jesus kind of a water barn pulpit. And when Jesus is finished teaching, Jesus turns to Simon and says, Simon, go out a little deeper and cast your net. Now, Jesus is a carpenter. Je Jesus knows about finishing wood. You know, he can, he can, he's a master carpenter. Simon is an expert fisherman. The carpenter who works with wood tells the commercial fisherman who is successful enough to own his own boat to go fish in the daytime. Nobody who's a commercial fisherman fishes in the daytime. The fish are not catchable in the daytime. They're not near the surface at the daytime. If you go fishing in the daytime on your own, you're wasting your time. The carpenter tells the fisherman, in the daytime, launch out into the deep and cast your net. And so Simon says, now Jesus, <laughs> you know, we, we're commercial fishermen. We've been at this a while. My daddy was a fisherman. His daddy was a fisherman. I run the business and, and, and I've been able to mature the business, to grow the business. I'm, I'm, I'm good at what I do. And we, we've been out here all night. And the implication is if you were new about fishing, you would know that you don't fish in a day. That's the implication. But at your word, since you said so, because you asked me, now, remember a little earlier, Simon's mother-in-law had been sick and Jesus had healed her. So he'd had, he'd had a little sample of what Jesus could do. It wasn't like he was totally oblivious. He'd had a little taste of what Jesus could do. And he had heard him teaching about the kingdom and he had seen the crowd, so he decided I'll take a chance on Jesus. Somebody sitting here today, you take a chance on a whole lot of foolishness. But won't take a chance on Jesus. So he said, Jesus, we've been out here all night. Nothing happened. But at your word, we'll give it a shot. So he launches out into the deep cast his net in the daytime when no fish are supposed to be there. And there's so many fish that they can't handle it all. And then he sends for the next company. John, James, son of Zebedee, 
come here, there's so much fish, we can't haul it. Now, this is iron power, and I'm on a time constraint, but if I had a little time, I'd stop there and talk about what happens when you think that a blessing has come to you rather than through you. So, so they don't try to keep it like some of us are prone to do. But they share it and they call for somebody else, come get it, and there's so much that the boats almost sink. But they manage just barely to get this unprecedented haul of fish caught in the daytime at the advice of a carpenter who doesn't know about commercial fishing. But at his word, an unprecedented harvest was caught. And then it occurred to Peter, to Simon. Now, if it was some of us, we would have decided, Jesus, when can we go again? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know somebody here. I'm hearing you now. I wish Jesus would help me get a big haul like that, and I'd invest it. And then I'd get Jesus to go back again, and we'd make a killing. That's because you wrapped up in your own consumerism. And God is not interested in your accumulation. God is wondering whether you can be trusted for distribution so that none go without. So Peter, Simon is not like us deciding how I'm going to cash in. But he falls at the knees of Jesus. And then he says to Jesus, Go away from me. I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm a sinner. Can't you hear the sadness in his voice when it occurs to him who Jesus is and who I am? He was a successful businessman, owned his own fishing company, place of respectability in the city probably had a house right on the lake. A lakefront estate. He had it going on. But when he saw Jesus, all of his fame and fortune paled in comparison. He falls at Jesus' knees and says, go away from me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. I'm not trying to show you up. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself. Don't, don't, don't feel bad about it. But while you've, been trying, while you've been caught up in your fishing business, I want you to come get caught up in my business. So you've been catching fish for consumption. <laughs> but from now on, you're going to catch people for the kingdom. So that people who are lost and suffering and struggling can find help and hope and a future in Jesus Christ. You've been using your skills for yourself. Now come and use them for my work. And Simon and James and John left everything. And followed him. They got so caught up in Jesus that they were able to walk away from their own construction. 
from their own life that they've been building a life. They've been building a reputation. They've been accumulating wealth. They've been doing it and everybody's been respecting them and they walk away because they've been caught up in something that won't let them go. Somebody here today, you've been caught up in some things that are pretty inspiring. But Jesus is calling you today. Somebody else in here has been caught up in some mess. And it's eating you alive. Jesus is calling you to get caught up in him. You've been trying to sing your own song. He wants for a song to sing you. <laughs> You've been trying to do it your way. Jesus wants you. Can you hear him? I wonder, can you hear him? You know, I'm kind of old school, so there used to be a song that said something like this, that you, you can build cathedrals, large or small. You can build skyscrapers, Mr. Trump, grand and tall. You can conquer all life's failures, Ms. Clinton, of the past, but only what you do for Christ will last. 